Released in 1989, the Game Boy has endured as one of Nintendo's most iconic and best-selling pieces of hardware. Today, just hearing the name Game Boy is enough to make us think about its Smash hits, like Super Mario Land, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, Wario Land, Kirby's Dream Land, Tetris, or the Pokemon series. But the Game Boy's success wasn't guaranteed or even expected. Not good, hopeless, obsolete. At one point, all of these words were used by many Nintendo employees to describe the Game Boy before it was released. There was even an internal plot to have the Game Boy canceled during its development, and it succeeded. So how did the Game Boy go from hopeless and canceled to selling over 118 million units, leaving the DS and Switch as the only lines of Nintendo products to have sold more? In this video, we're going to take a look at how Nintendo's Research and Development One team defied the president of Nintendo himself, risking their own careers in order to craft one of the greatest gaming devices of all time. From its Game & Watch inspirations, to the risky pack entitled Tetris, and its tumultuous development filled with twists, betrayals, and yes, even its cancellation, this is the story behind the creation of the original Game Boy. Much of the information in this video regarding the Game Boy's behind-the-scenes development comes from Florent George's book, The History of Nintendo, Volume 4. This book is filled with first-hand interviews and accounts from the people directly involved in creating the Game Boy. As of the time of this video, it's only been published in French and Spanish. You hell from the future here. I recently spoke with Florent George, and he wanted me to pass along that The History of Nintendo, Volume 4, will be available in English this year. That's 2024. He didn't have an exact date yet, but you can follow him on Twitter to keep yourself updated. And a special thanks to Low Spec Gamer for providing me with a Spanish version of the book, as my copy is in French and being a fluent Spanish speaker, his copy was much easier for me to digest and translate. The Game Boy's development officially began on June 10th, 1987, when Gunpei Yokoi, the head of Nintendo's Research and Development One, more commonly known as R&D One, held a meeting to inform his team that Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi wanted R&D One to produce a sequel to the incredibly successful Game & Watch line. Unlike the Game & Watch line, President Yamauchi wanted this new portable device to be able to play multiple games. He had one other challenging ask of R&D One, bring it to the market for 10,000 yen, which in the Game Boy's eventual release year of 1989 would have been around 72 US dollars. Fortunately, R&D One wasn't quite starting the Game Boy from scratch. First released in 1980, the Game & Watch was a series of single game devices originally invented by Gunpei and further developed by R&D One. Since the Game & Watch's release, R&D One frequently researched and experimented with new screens and other technology that could be used in future Game & Watch devices. Although this research was described as relaxed by R&D One member Yoshihiro Taki, it would nonetheless come to help R&D One with the Game Boy's development. Ironically, it would be the success of a home console, the Famicom, that would soon change R&D One's sense of urgency when it came to their portable research. Released in Japan in July of 1983, the Famicom was the creation of R&D2, another research and development team within Nintendo that had been positioned as a sort of rival to R&D1 by President Yamauchi. Since 1965, Gunpei Yokoi and his R&D1 division had been the golden goose for Nintendo, with significant commercial successes such as Yokoi's Ultra Hand toy and the aforementioned Game & Watch. But by the end of 1984, things were different. The Famicom had become Japan's best-selling game console, and suddenly R&D2 and its director Masayuki Yumera were the new superstars of Nintendo in President Yamauchi's eyes. Game & Watch, trovi Snoopy, Mario's e il fantastico Donkey Kong. Puoi giocarci in trasparenza in Game & Watch Nintendo. Although the Game & Watch remained popular for many years in the rest of the world, by 1983 Japan had begun losing interest in it due in part to the Japanese market becoming flooded with low-quality clones and knockoffs that turned consumers away. Now, the Game & Watch's success in other markets allowed R&D 1 to continue releasing profitable new games and models, but R&D 2's Famicom was now the company's prize jewel. Jokoi felt that if he and R&D 1 were to again be seen as Nintendo's development leaders, they would need to think beyond the Game & Watch. As a result, in 1984, R&D 1 ramped up their research and prototype development in a way unofficially beginning the Game Boy's development three years early. Thanks to this research, R&D One was able to immediately decide at their first meeting 
to use a dot matrix screen for their new handheld and gave their new project its codename right then and there. DMG or dot matrix game. Yokoi and R&D1 all agreed that their first step should be to figure out which dot matrix screen they'd use. After all, the screen's speed, size, and capabilities would not only be a major factor in determining other hardware and the type of games it would play, but also battery life and the cost of the device itself. R&D1 approached Nintendo's longtime partner Sharp and supplied the screens for the Game & Watch. R&D1 experimented with several of Sharp's screens used in PDAs, but they would leave streaks and blurs when testing them with a simple game they created named Tombatori. R&D1 even tried using a Sharp black and white mini TV, and while the display speed, contrast, and shades of gray were excellent, Sharp's prices were not. Eventually, R&D1 reached out to several screen manufacturers, but most weren't interested. One company that was very interested in working with Nintendo was watch and calculator maker Citizen. Citizen visited Nintendo headquarters and impressed them with a presentation of their screens that featured a chip-on-glass technology where the LCD controller was attached directly onto the LCD's glass surface. This design would save space, reducing wiring costs, and save time and money in labor and production. Citizen gave Nintendo two options. One was a monochromatic screen that could be produced for 1,300 yen each. The other was a color screen option that would cost 3,900 yen to make. Citizen's color screen wouldn't have just been more expensive. It would have also drained batteries much faster, something that Sega Game Gear owners can test to. Yokoi's choice of the cheaper black and white screen wasn't just a way to meet President Yamauchi's directive for a 10,000 yen device. Besides the battery issues, Yokoi found that the color screens were more difficult to be seen in sunlight. But maybe more importantly, using a monochromatic screen fell in line with Yokoi's philosophy known as lateral thinking of withered technology. Which essentially means that Yokoi thought it was better to find new ways to use cheaper and older technology rather than having to deal with the technical challenges and expenses that often come with ironing out the kinks of new tech. Now, Sharp was an important partner for Nintendo. And wanting to maintain a good relationship with them, Nintendo asked Sharp if they could provide a screen with similar technology and match Citizen's price. Not only did Sharp give Nintendo a quote of 2,500 to 3,000 yen per screen, unlike Citizen, Sharp was also vague about what their screens would include. Citizen eventually agreed to drop their quote to 1,000 yen per screen, and after a few weeks of negotiations, Yamauchi gave Yokoi his approval to use Citizen's screen on August 28, 1987. Yet, the Game Boy never ended up using Citizen's screen, and what happened next would be the first of several betrayals in the Game Boy's development store. On September 1st, representatives from Citizen arrived at Nintendo's offices to iron out the details of the contract with Yokoi and other R&D1 members. After an hour, both sides had agreed in principle to a deal but as Yokoi was escorting Citizen's management out, they walked past the delegation from Sharp in the hallway that was heading directly to President Yamauchi's office. An hour later, Koi was called into President Yamauchi's office. Yamauchi ordered Yokoi to cancel everything with Citizen and instead sign a contract with Sharp. Yokoi explained that Citizen had left with a pre-agreement committing Nintendo to working with them for several years, but Yamauchi's mind was made up. No one's exactly sure of how Sharp convinced Yamauchi to have Nintendo go back on its work to Citizen. It's assumed that Sharp promised Nintendo they would match Citizen's prices and press the importance of the two companies working together upon Yamauchi. In a strange turn of events, Nintendo's betrayal of Citizen would later end up benefiting Sega. Gunbei Yokoi tasked R&D1 member Yoshihiro Taki with informing Citizen that Nintendo wouldn't honor their preliminary agreement. Initially, R&D1 asked Citizen to postpone drawing up the official contract for three weeks, as something had come up. In reality, R&D1 used those three weeks to formulate an almost unbelievable plan. Taki would tell Citizen that Sharp was going to produce the monochrome screens for their DMG project, but that about a year later, they would have Citizen provide color screens for another portable device. Taki went as far as preparing fake project documents with the architecture of the non-existent 8-bit portable console, even including a price tag of 19,800 yen. Taki was disgusted by the situation, but Yokoi really gave him no choice. A year went by and Nintendo never heard back from Citizen. 
If you were colorblind and had an IQ less than 12, then you wouldn't care which portable you had. Of course, you wouldn't care if you drank from the toilet either. When the Sega Game Gear was released in Japan in 1990, Taki purchased one to study and couldn't believe his eyes once he opened it up. According to Taki, much of the Game Gear's design was very close to the fake portable he had created. Even its 19,800 yen launch price matched. Then, Taki saw it. The Game Gear screen was made by none other than Citizen. Citizen, of course, never admitted to giving any part of Taki's design to Sega. Now, back to 1987. Though they had been awarded the DMG screen contract, it turned out that Sharp wasn't even ready to provide Nintendo with the kinds of screens that they needed. Sharp's issues with parts, designs, and costs would go on for months, contributing to a delay in the Game Boy's development, but at least the fight between Sharp and Citizen had ended. Unfortunately, there was an even bigger battle brewing within R&D 1 itself. Gunpei Yokoi is often credited as the Game Boy's sole inventor, but in reality, the Game Boy was primarily created by four people, Satoru Okada, Takehiro Izushi, Yoshihiro Taki, and Yokoi himself. But Yokoi had less of an impact on the Game Boy's design than most articles and videos on the internet would have you believe. In fact, the final product ended up being very little like what he envisioned. You see, just as Citizen and Sharp were fighting to become the Game Boy screen provider during its first few months of development, so were Yokoi and Satoru Okada battling over which direction the DMG product would take. Their disagreements were so bad that they often derailed R&D1's meetings. In interviews with Okada, once again in the history of Nintendo Volume 4, Okada revealed that Yokoi wanted the Game Boy to be a direct follow-up to the Game & Watch, a cheap device with quick, simple games and very likely a short product life cycle. Yokoi also didn't see a need for the new handheld to have third-party title or support. Game Boy Sound hardware designer and fellow R&D1 member Hirokazu Tanaka confirmed Okada's claim, stating, I don't think I'm wrong in saying that Okada was the one who pushed for the Game Boy to use interchangeable ROM cartridges and a link cable to exchange data. Yukoi wanted something much simpler, closer to a toy. In the end, he let Okada convince him and approved his ideas. But I remember that at the beginning, Yukoi didn't want Famicom-like cartridges, and he didn't come up with the idea of a link cable. Hirokazu Tanaka, The History of Nintendo Volume 4. Instead of cartridges, Yokoi wanted to use cheap, swappable screen filters to switch between games. Now, Yokoi's aversion to a more complex cartridge-based device may have stemmed from not wanting to be seen as taking inspiration from the rivals in R&D 2. According to a 1996 Bunjie Shunju article penned by Gunpei Yokoi himself, before the release of the Game & Watch, Nintendo was in debt somewhere between 7 and 8 billion yen. That's around 53.5 million US dollars, which adjusted for inflation is about 200 million dollars in 2024. Yokoi wrote that a year after the Game & Watch's release, Nintendo's debts had been paid off, and they now had 4 billion yen in the bank. Yokoi and R&D1's Game & Watch had saved Nintendo, yet now it was R&D2's Famicom getting most of the attention and praise for Nintendo's good fortune. Yokoi was so adamant about avoiding any association between the Game Boy and R&D2 that when brainstorming names for their new handheld, R&D1 deliberately steered clear of names like Pocket Famicom or any others that could link their device to Nintendo's 8-bit home console. Okada, on the other hand, wanted the Game Boy to be closer to a portable Famicom than a simple toy, something that would last for years and be able to play more complex games. Okada also wanted to have a proper dev kit with documentation for third-party developers, something that the Famicom was missing when it launched. Yokoi initially rejected Okada's ideas, which included making a straight-up handheld version of the Famicom with a more powerful CPU than was found in the home console. Okada went as far as reaching out to Famicom chip manufacturer Rico to help him create a portable Famicom, but this time, it was R&D2 director Yumera who blocked Okada claiming that Rico was too busy with development of the Super Famicom, which had just been announced to the public in September of 1987. Some suspect that Yumera's real reason for interfering is simply that the rivalry between the research divisions went both ways. But regardless, Okada's persistence in fighting for his vision of what the Game Boy should be eventually paid off. I was the assistant director of R&D 1, and we had many arguments over this. In the end, he gave in and angrily told me, Okay, do what you want. I then asked him, fine, but are you going to give me full responsibility? 
and since he said yes, I made the Game Boy Project my own. Yukoi just gave me his seal of approval. In the end, the Game Boy is much more similar to the Famicom than the Game & Watch. The hardware was good enough to offer a wide variety of games, and we were ready to welcome third-party editors with a real development kit, instruction booklets, some real support, etc. Satoru Okada, Retro Gamer Issue 163. Now that's not to say that Yokoi wasn't important in the Game Boy's development. He still approved everything, negotiated with component suppliers, added his own ideas, and sold Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi on R&D1's final vision for the Game Boy. And as we'll see later, secretly continued working on the Game Boy even after its development had been canceled, becoming the Game Boy's savior in the process. Without Yokoi, there is no Game Boy. Sadly, according to Okada, his disagreements with Yokoi during the Game Boy's development caused their relationship to deteriorate. Okada has clarified that he felt Yokoi always had good ideas, but Yokoi's desire to build simple games and toys simply wasn't the direction Nintendo was heading in. They said it wasn't humanly possible, but now you can have all the power and excitement of Nintendo right in the palm of your hand. Introducing Game Boy. Sharp's involvement with the Game Boy extended beyond the screen. They were also responsible for supplying the CPU and sound chips. Thankfully, unlike the screen, the development of these components was free of turmoil and drama. Music composer Hirokazu Tanaka, whose work you may know from Tetris, Metroid, Kid Icarus, Super Mario Land, and more, was assigned to work with Sharp to design the sound chip. Tanaka was also one of the creators of the Game Boy Camera, which I'll be covering in depth in its own video soon. Tanaka and Sharp used the Famicom's Rico sound chip as their blueprint. Though the Game Boy has four channels versus the Famicom's five, as well as a few other differences. The Game Boy only features one speaker, but can output stereo if headphones are used. The CPU's development was overseen by Satoru Okada. Something that's interesting to note is that the NES uses an 8-bit Rico-made CPU clocked in at 1.79 MHz with access to two kilobytes of RAM and an additional 2 kilobytes of video RAM. The Game Boy features an 8-bit Sharp CPU based on both a Z80 and Intel 8080 processor with a clock speed of 4.19 MHz. The CPU's output is bottlenecked by the 1 MHz speed of the system's 8 kilobytes of work RAM, but also has access to another 8 kilobytes of video RAM. These specs have led many to feel that the Game Boy is actually more powerful than the Famicom slash NES, but I'll leave that debate for those with more technical expertise. Although most of the Game Boy's hardware was coming together, the screen continued to be an issue. R&D1 and Sharp tried various screens and as prototypes began to circulate within Nintendo, a considerable number of employees were less than impressed and nicknamed the DMG project Dame Game, with Dame meaning not good or hopeless in Japanese. The DMG's detractor's main complaint was the choice of a black and white screen, which many felt would make the Game Boy obsolete as soon as it was released. After all, Color LCDs were becoming more and more common, and more importantly, during the Game Boy's own development, a company named Epix approached Nintendo to try to sell them a color screen portable that they were working on, the Handy. Nintendo declined and the Handy was eventually sold to Atari and renamed the Lynx. Using a monochrome screen was one of the few things Yokoi and Okada actually agreed on, and changing to a color screen was never even considered. As the summer of 1988 approached, R&D1's work on the final DMG prototype was nearly finished, and on June 1, 1988, R&D1 finally gave the DMG project its official name, Game Boy. The name came from Game Boy Magazine, a Japanese video game publication that had been around since 1985, yet hadn't bothered to trademark their own name. R&D1 let the magazine know that they were planning to use the Game Boy name for a console, and likely to avoid any ill will or litigation, offered to buy advertising in each issue of the magazine going forward. With a name in place, R&D1 was ready to show the final Game Boy prototype to President Yamauchi for his approval. But unfortunately for R&D1, instead of receiving final approval to bring the Game Boy to life, Yamauchi would put it to death. Not long after the DMG was christened the Game Boy, Gunpei Yokoi and his team arrived at President Yamauchi's office to show him the final prototype. R&D1's years of official and unofficial development, countless hours spent working with sharp engineers, their deception of citizen, and months of suffering the ridicule of their co-workers, it had all led to this moment. 
the moment that would make all of their work and sacrifice worth it. Yamauchi picked up the Game Boy prototype, tilting it like he had done with many a Game & Watch, and said, What is this? You can't see anything. Are you trying to sell me something that can't be seen? Forget about this. R&D1 frantically tried to show Yamauchi how to position the screen, but his mind was made up. No, this does not work, said Yamauchi. And with that sentence, the project was cancelled, the Game Boy was dead. No one in R&D1 took the news harder than its director, Gunpei Yokoi. In his autobiography, Yokoi describes entering into a state of severe depression. Yokoi barely eats to the point where he's diagnosed with malnutrition and even contemplates ending his life. According to Yoshihiro Taki, there were no technical reasons to cancel the Game Boy, least of all the screen. They could easily improve the screen's visibility by either making price or performance concessions. There were even settings that they could have tweaked on the one presented to Yamauchi, but the president just wasn't interested in any of it. He wouldn't provide names, but Taki is on the record stating that there were people within Nintendo that sabotaged the Game Boy by getting into Yamauchi's ear, convincing him that it would fail and that its failure would severely hurt Nintendo financially and worse, irreparably damage their reputation in the video game market and harm the entire company. Taki believes that because of this, Yamauchi was ready to cancel the project at the first sign of a problem, no matter how small. The motivation for the sabotage was simple. Yamauchi was getting older and some thought Yokoi may replace him one day. The saboteur saw destroying the Game Boy as a way to seize power for themselves. On top of this, the Famicom was still selling extremely well and the Super Famicom, which was being developed around the same time as the Game Boy, was the console that the public was really excited about. As both consoles' development went on, Yamauchi began to see the Game Boy as less important, and after being warned of its impending doom by people he trusted, he preferred to cancel the Game Boy rather than risk its failure hurting Super Famicom sales. Shortly after the Game Boy project was canceled, the majority of R&D1's members were reassigned to other projects. Even Satoru Okada is reassigned to help develop Famicom games. R&D1 is left with just the skeleton crew to work on Game & Watch devices. Yet, with the situation at its most dire, Gunpei Yokoi decides that he isn't ready to give up on the Game Boy. Alongside remaining R&D1 team members Takahiro Izushi and Yoshihiro Taki, Gunpei Yokoi sets out on a professionally dangerous mission. Defy President Yamauchi and save the Game Boy. During the Game Boy's development, R&D1 developed a close relationship with a man named Nakamura, the director at Sharp who oversaw the Game & Watch screens. Thanks to this friendship, Izushi, Yokoi, and Taki continued to work with Sharp on the Game Boy screen in secret, careful not to arouse the suspicion of the Game Boy's critics within Nintendo. Yoshihiro Taki would work directly with Nakamura and others at Sharp on screen modifications that he would later take to Yokoi and Izushi for prototype testing. One day, a Sharp employee showed Taki a new secret screen that Sharp was working on that used something called Super Twisted Pneumatic Technology. This new screen's contrast was actually a little worse than the regular twisted pneumatic screens R&D1 had used in their earlier prototypes, but the viewing angle was much wider. The super twisted pneumatic screen also had a noticeably greener tint to it. The Sharp employee asked Taki to keep it a secret as Sharp's higher-ups had yet to announce its existence, nor had they approved for it to be shown to any outsiders. Once again, as detailed in the history of Nintendo Volume 4, after Taki was able to secretly verify that the new screen would work for the Game Boy, he and Yokoi hatched a plan to get Sharp to reveal the screen's existence to them. During a meeting with a member of Sharp's board, Yokoi asked if they were sure that they didn't have any other screens that would better fit what they were looking for. Perhaps something still in development that was almost ready for production. Yokoi pressed the issue and eventually the board member ended up bringing up the super twisted pneumatic screen himself. A few days later, Sharp's engineers officially presented their new screen to Izushi, Yokoi, and Taki, who were thrilled. It didn't take long for R&D1 to have a new prototype featuring Sharp's green, super-twisted pneumatic screen ready. R&D1 showed the new prototype to a few people they could trust at Nintendo's Yuji Manufacturing Factory, as they would need the factory to accept the build of any prototype before it could receive final approval. Up to this point, R&D1 had spent three months working on the Game Boy screen without the knowledge of anyone else at Nintendo. 
Armed with a new screen and the approval of the engineers at the Yuji plant, Gunpei Yokoi set up a meeting with President Yamauchi with one goal, to resurrect the Game Boy. When Yokoi showed off the new prototype to Yamauchi, he picked it up at the same angle that caused him to cancel the Game Boy. Only this time, the screen remained visible. Yamauchi wasn't completely satisfied with the screen, but he knew it would be more than good enough to deliver a high quality gaming experience on the go. Yamauchi approved the new prototype. Yokoi, Izushi, and Taki had not only succeeded in resurrecting the Game Boy, they managed to do it without getting in trouble for defying the president's orders to stop working on it. Ironically, R&D 1 likely have R&D 2 to think, as their Super Famicom had experienced fairly significant delays during its development. As Taki put it, I think Yamauchi wanted to stop producing portable devices once the Super Famicom was released. The idea was to focus all activities around a single product, but he probably felt uncomfortable because the Super Famicom was taking a while. Yoshiro Taki, The History of Nintendo Volume 4 Due to those delays, the Super Famicom's launch was two years away, and Yamauchi was concerned that customers may switch to products from Sega or NEC if Nintendo had nothing new to offer. The Game Boy's production shell was designed by Shin Kojo with input from American NES shell designer Lance Barr. The Game Boy's last step before entering mass production was passing through rigorous quality tests at Nintendo's UG manufacturing plant that included poking needles through the holes for the speaker. Just as the Game Boy was about to go into mass production, R&D 1 received another blow. The Game Boy had failed to receive FCC certification. Without the FCC certification, the UG factory would not start production. Thankfully, R&D 1 was able to make the necessary adjustments, and on January 11th, 1989, just three months before its Japan launch and six months before its North American release, the Game Boy received its FCC certification and production finally began. The Game Boy may not have been the device that Yokoi wanted to make, but his leadership and willingness to take risks had made him and those under him its savior. And perhaps, more importantly to Yokoi, in President Yamauchi's eyes, Gunpei Yokoi had once again saved Nintendo. On January 17, 1989, Nintendo held a press conference to officially present the Game Boy to the Japanese media. Nintendo announced that they expected to produce 300,000 Game Boys a month but anticipated a shortage of consoles once the Game Boy launched in North America in July. Nintendo touted the long battery life and price, which, due to the higher than expected cost of RAM and the final screen, came in at 12,500 yen. President Yamauchi decided to soften the blow of the Game Boy's price by including four AA batteries and headphones, which, when purchased in bulk, were really pennies on the dollar. Some journalists complained about the screen size and small sprites, but when the Game Boy is finally released in Japan on April 21st, 1989, it's a smash hit. After a week, the entire first run of 300,000 units had sold out, and by August, over 720,000 Game Boys and 1.9 million cartridges had sold in Japan alone. In Japan, the Game Boy launched with only four titles, Alleyway, Baseball, Yakuman, and Super Mario Land, which would go on to sell over 18 million copies worldwide. Though it took a slightly different path, the Game Boy's North America launch was also wildly successful. There were five launch titles in North America, Alleyway, Super Mario Land, Baseball, Tennis, and Tetris, with the last three supporting the Game Boy's link cable for head-to-head -head gameplay. In Japan, the Game Boy didn't come with any games, but in North America, the Game Boy launched with Tetris as its pack-in title and was backed by a $20 million marketing campaign which was much more than Nintendo of America would usually spend for a launch, but NOA president Minoru Arakawa wanted the Game Boy to become the quintessential hard-to-find Christmas gift by the time the holiday season rolled around. During the Game Boy's development, the NES Famicom port of Tetris that Bulletproof Software was working on began circulating around Nintendo. Many employees were hooked, and upon seeing Tetris, Yokoi and Okada were convinced that it could be the killer app to sell the Game Boy in the US. Meanwhile, Bulletproof Software founder Hank Rogers was already working on securing the handheld rights for Tetris, and while the Game Boy port wouldn't be ready in time for the Japanese launch of the Game Boy, it would be ready for its North American release. Originally, Super Mario Land was going to be the North American packing title, but Hank Rogers convinced Nintendo of America president Arakawa to use Tetris instead explaining to him, Well, if you want little boys to buy your Game Boy, 
then include Mario. But if you want everyone to buy your Game Boy, then include Tetris. You can still sell Mario afterwards. Hank Rogers, Polygon.com. Though some slightly different sales figures are out there, according to the official Tetris website, Tetris sold over 35 million units for the Game Boy. The majority of Nintendo of America's Game Boy marketing budget went to TV commercials aimed at older teenagers so that it didn't appear like it was exclusively designed for younger children. Another big piece of NOA's marketing strategy was to use in-store kiosks where customers could play the Game Boy for themselves. Nintendo's strategy worked. By the end of 1989, Nintendo had shipped about 1.1 million Game Boys to the US and completely sold out with demand far exceeding supply. Throughout 1990, the Game Boy continued its strong sales, and by spring of that same year, Nintendo had devised strategies to boost production, ramping up to a rate of 1 million units per month by July. The Game Boy amassed a long list of notable and high-selling games throughout its life cycle. Titles such as Wario Land, Super Mario Land 3, Link's Awakening, the first game in the Kirby series, Kirby's Dream Land, and of course, introduced the monstrous Pokemon series to the world in 1996. Those are just a few examples, as we'd be here all day if we did a deep dive into the Game Boy's massive library. The focus of this video is on the development of the original Game Boy, but I know I would be remiss and eaten alive in the comments if I didn't at least mention the revisions and spin-off models based on the original Game Boy. 1996 saw the release of the Game Boy Pocket. As the name implies, this was a smaller version of the Game Boy and only required two AAA batteries. It was equipped with a new LCD screen whose picture was closer to true black and white as opposed to the greenish gray tint of the original. I've never played one of these myself, but supposedly this improved LCD nearly eliminates screen ghosting, but the screen was still not backlit. However, in April of 1998, Nintendo finally released a backlit screen model in the Game Boy Lite, which was only available in Japan. Both of these models played the same titles as the original Game Boy. It wouldn't be until the Game Boy Color was released in October of 1998 in Japan and a month later in North America that we'd see a model with some of its own exclusive games. The Game Boy Color uses a color sharp LCD screen, sorry citizen, with 32,768 colors available and the capability to display up to 56 of those colors at once. Though there are tricks that can be used to display more colors at a time, and a rarely used high color mode that could display up to 2,000 colors at once. This mode was used in Alone in the Dark, The New Nightmare, whose box includes a only four Game Boy Color label. Because while the Game Boy Color was backwards compatible with original monochrome Game Boy games, it also had its own exclusive library of titles that wouldn't play on the previous black and white models. The Game Boy Color also had more RAM and, at least according to Nintendo, twice the processing power though it's using the same CPU as the original Game Boy. This is barely scratching the surface when it comes to the Game Boy Color, which really deserves its own video to cover it properly. One thing about the Game Boy Color is that, like the original Game Boy, its screen was, once again, not backlit. However, there were third-party companies that were more than happy sell us accessories for the original Game Boy that they claimed would enhance the user experience by addressing issues such as screen visibility and a whole lot more. There were a ton of accessories for the Game Boy. Some were useful and basic such as the official rechargeable battery pack, carrying cases, and the link cable which allowed two Game Boys to be connected for multiplayer gameplay, trading Pokemon, and more. You could even connect four players together with the Game Boy 4 player adapter. Other accessories were a bit more exotic, like the Super Game Boy, which allowed you to play Game Boy games on a SNES. The Super Game Boy itself actually has the same hardware as an original Game Boy, with the Super Nintendo mostly only being used for controller input, transmitting graphics to the screen, and for adding extra colors and borders to Game Boy games specifically made to support these Super Game Boy features. Some Game Boy games like Contra, The Alien Wars, could also use the SNES hardware for extra features like enhanced audio. A follow-up named the Super Game Boy 2 was released, but only in Japan. New to this version was a link cable port, as well as running at the same speed as a Game Boy. Unlike the original Super Game Boy, which ran 2.4% faster than the handheld version. But there are a ton of other accessories. The Light Boy was one of many screen magnifying and lighting accessories. 
The Handy Boy amplified, well, everything, including the speakers. The Barcode Boy was used to scan barcode cards in games such as Monster Maker, Barcode Saga, as well as some horse racing games in Japan. For charging on a long camping trip, there was the Game Boy Solar Charger, or if you're going fishing, you can use the Game Boy Pocket Sonar to locate fish underwater. Want a more arcade-like experience for your Game Boy? Well, Konami had you covered with the Konami Hyper Boy. Lucky you, I guess. Like every console from this era, the Game Boy also had cheat devices like the Game Genie. But personally, the accessory I find the most interesting is the Game Boy Camera and Printer. Like I said, I'll have a full video covering this up soon, but it's exactly what it sounds like. A camera that lets you take pictures directly on your Game Boy. You could also do some basic photo editing right on your Game Boy, add stickers to your pictures, or stitch a few together into a very basic animation. You could even print your pictures out with the Game Boy printer. And these are really only some of the Game Boy's official and third-party accessories. We could, once again, be here all day talking about Game Boy accessories. But suffice it to say that the Game Boy's popularity and unique hardware really lent itself to create this sort of Wild West ecosystem of accessories. Some were cheap and borderline useless pieces of plastic, and others, like the Game Boy camera, were a glimpse of what was to come. The Game Boy was a runaway hit, but it wasn't without competition. The Atari Lynx, Sega Game Gear, and NEC's Turbo Express were all released between 1989 and 1990, but ultimately, they couldn't really compete with the Game Boy's battery life, library, or price point. The Turbo Express sold 1.5 million units. Depending on your source, the Lynx sold between 500,000 and 2 million devices, while Sega managed to sell a more respectable 11 million Game Gears but they all pale in comparison to the original Game Boy and Game Boy Color's final combined sales of 118.69 million, as reported by Nintendo themselves. We don't know exactly how many of that 118 million comes from the original Game Boy, but thanks to a consolidated sales data PDF on Nintendo's Japanese website, we know that by the end of Nintendo's fiscal year in March of 1998, the original Game Boy had already sold 64 million units as the Game Boy wouldn't be released until October of 98 in Japan and November in the States. Before the Game Boy Color was released in North America in November of 1998, the original Game Boy saw versions of the monochrome screen model with color shells released in 1994 in Japan and 1995 in North America. Even after the release of the Color Game Boy, the original black and white Game Boy had officially licensed games released for it through at least 2001. But that's not where the DMG Game Boy story ends. Today, the Game Boy continues to be an important part of pop culture. There's a vibrant Game Boy chiptune music scene that includes live performances with real Game Boys and runs the gamut in terms of styles and creativity. There are all sorts of mods for the original set of Game Boys ranging from backlit screen replacements, modern rechargeable batteries complete with USB-C charging ports, custom shells, silicone and LED illuminated button replacements, and there's even a kit that allows CS lenses to be used with the Game Boy camera. The Game Boy's homebrew development scene is also alive and well, with dozens upon dozens of titles, with new games continuing to be made as of the time of this video in 2024. After nearly 31 years of service, Gunpei Yokoi left Nintendo in 1996 and founded his own development company, Koto Laboratory. The last major project he was credited with overseeing at Nintendo was The Virtual Boy, an infamous commercial failure. Many thought that The Virtual Boy's poor performance was what led to Yokoi's resignation. But in fact, as Yokoi wrote in Bunjai Shunju magazine, he simply wanted the freedom to work on his own ideas and that he had long wanted to work independently once he reached the age of 55, and that his resignation had nothing to do with the Virtual Boy. Yokoi's Koto Laboratory and Bandai would go on to develop the Wonder Swan portable system, which was released in Japan in 1999. Unfortunately, Gunpei wouldn't get to see its release, as his life was cut tragically short on October 4th, 1997, when he was struck and killed by a vehicle. Satoru Okada would go on to become the director of technical development for Nintendo, where he contributed to the development of the Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance series, and the Nintendo DS. Whether you're looking at home or portable console sales numbers, to this day, 
The original lineup of Game Boy and Game Boy Color devices remains one of the best-selling game consoles of all time, and its 118 million units sold leaves the DS and Switch as the only lines of Nintendo products to have sold more. Not too shabby for a canceled and hopeless project. I know that I haven't posted a video in a very long time, so I want to thank all of you for being patient and sticking with me. I was dealing with some bad tendonitis issues in both my forearms for years, actually, but uh, I'm pretty much over it now. I'm all better and plan to post regularly once again. I also want to send a special thank you to all of my Patreon members for your support. It is always truly appreciated. Another big thanks to Low Spec Gamer, who has his own video about the Game Boy that really dives into the more technical aspects of things like the way the screen works and its technology. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. Keep up on what's happening with the channel. Follow me on Twitter at WrestlesGaming. If you'd like to support the channel monetarily, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash wrestling with gaming. Most of all, sincerely, thank you for watching.